welcome back to the last uh, last day of the lecture. And uh, um, so uh, congratulations for uh, every participant. So you are almost uh, basically in the, you will be in the uh, frontier of uh, uh, this entire field uh, by the end of today's lecture, I think. Um, so let me not spend too, way too much time, um, uh, like stealing time from uh, Ravi. So let me just briefly, briefly introduce, uh, uh, introduce him. Um, so, uh, Dr. Ja Ravi Jagadisan, uh, so he is um, a current uh, postdoc, postdoc fellow uh, at Stanford. So he received a uh, high school diploma in 2014 and a BA um, from Harvard uh, in 2018 and a PhD also uh, from Harvard in uh, 2020. So, well, you might notice that that sounds really uh, unusual. Oh, well, yes, so he got a PhD in just two years. Uh, which is, of course, very, very, very exceptional. Uh, so he's very ex exceptional in many senses. So including this very fact I just mentioned, uh, he is known for his um, mathematical or ex exceptional mathematical ability. Um, you might notice that he is uh, um, uh, in the, the Mass Olympic and he's one of the very few Putnam Fellow. Um, which is uh, arguably the most uh, prestigious math competition uh, that I, um, as far as I understand. Um, and the, he, he's, um, uh, so he has, uh, uh, although his career is still very short, so he has already written many papers uh, on various topics, of course, including matching and uh, uh, equilibrium with uh, transferable utility. Um, but today, so he will, uh, um, uh, he will narrow down, I guess, in a sense, uh, his, uh, his focus on a particular uh, uh, issue of, uh, of, of our topics, the individuality to, uh, 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 today. Okay, so, uh, okay, so, uh, okay, so I think uh, it makes a lot of sense for him to, uh, to uh, have uh, uh, as much time as possible. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, let's begin. So, uh, uh, Ravi, please, um, the floor is yours. Ah, I think you can, oh. can hear me now? Good, yeah. 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 Good. Perfect. Um, thanks for the very kind introduction, Fujito. Um, uh, and so uh, it's, it's very nice to be invited to participate in uh, this sequence of lectures. So I think you've already uh, heard quite a lot from uh, my co-authors, uh, Alex Tableboy and Elizabeth Bolton, about kind of all kinds of things about uh, gen about uh, competitive equilibrium in markets for indivisible goods. Uh, so the paper I want to present today, my lecture is really going to focus on one paper, is titled Matching and Prices. Uh, and this is joint work with Alex. Uh, and what we do in this paper is to try to think about the implications of the methods uh, that Alex uh, discussed yesterday evening uh, for matching markets. So to, just to put things in context, um, let me start out by saying something broad about indivisible goods, although I think you've probably heard more than enough of that by now. So there's many markets right, that involve uh, both indivisible goods and personalized interactions between agents. So kind of two, uh, the two examples that I'm gonna kind of, that are going to be a little bit recurring in my talk are auctions and labor markets, but this is also relevant in other contexts like uh, online platform. And one way to think about uh, both auctions and labor markets is through the lens of matching models. Uh, but uh, the, and the focus in uh, most matching models, of course, in addition to the indivisibility of the interactions between agents and the, uh, and the um, personalized nature of interactions, is that sellers in these markets often have constraints on what they can sell. So to, to, to just take some examples, I mean, like in a spectrum auction, you know, there the spectrum licenses are all different and they're all indivisible. But another important feature is that the government faces constraints on what they can sell. I mean, these, you know, different blocks of spectrum can interfere with each other. So I can, and I cannot sell interfering blocks of spectrum to different firms. And that's an important feature of spectrum auctions. 
Um, and also in markets like uh, residency and daycare allocation markets. Uh, so I think Yuchiro and Fujito have a, an important paper as well as some other work on uh, constraints that might be imposed uh, in terms of allocation of residents to regions or other types of allocational constraints on daycare. Uh, and that's another type of constraint kind of on the seller in terms of what sellers can sell. So in that market, if you imagine that what's being sold is daycare provision as a good to parents, uh, that, that, that would be a way to think about it. The, what I'm going to focus on today is something different, which is, uh, which is an important feature, I think, of, uh, of, of, of the versions of, 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 the, of the markets of these, uh, with indivisible goods and personalized interactions that involve prices, which is that buyers in these markets are often constrained in how much they can pay. So for example, in settings like in a spectrum auction, a telecom company may have a limited budget that it has allocated to purchase a spectrum. And you know, these licenses in the larger auctions, uh, the total payments by participants can total tens of billions of dollars. And so even firms at that level can experience constraints on how much they can pay. Another example would be a labor market. Right? So in a labor market, you know, workers are being hired by firms and work, they, the, the indivisibility here is that a worker either takes a job or does not. The personalization is that the workers are different. Uh, but again, here, there is a type of limit on how much firms might be able to spend, which is that they might have a hiring budget uh, allocated to Higher, allocated to salaries, uh, which they may not be able to exceed, or at least the hiring manager may not be able to exceed. So um, to, to kind of, to, to, to the difference between, uh, between what, what I'm going to do today and what, what Alex discussed uh, yesterday is that in, 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 in these examples, agents can completely exhaust their uh, budgets just within the market for indivisible goods. So for example, in a spectrum auction, a firm could spend its entire budget that it has allocated to spectrum licenses. Or in a labor market, a firm could spend its entire hiring budget and end up with no extra cash remaining. Uh, and this possibility in, I think in the auction and matching literature has been called like a hard budget constraint. It doesn't quite coincide, I think, with the notion of budget constraint from, from like say general equilibrium models where it's always imposed. But what I mean here, when, when I talk about a hard budget constraint here, I just mean that there's some budget that the agents can spend fully, but <laughs> beyond which they cannot spend anything. Uh, the difficulty with these types of hard budget constraints is that when, when you have indivisible goods and these types of hard budget constraints, competitive equilibrium may not exist. Uh, even in settings where agents have fairly simple preferences. Uh, and so if, we, if you want it, if, we, if, if one wants to take seriously these budget constraints, which I think is a, an important issue in, in these types of markets, uh, we'll, we'll need to think about things a bit differently. But what we do in this paper is to use insights from matching theory uh, to analyze markets for indivisible goods in which the buyers can have budget constraints. Well, um, and the idea is we're going to use stable outcomes as a replacement for competitive equilibrium, the settings for competitive equilibrium may not exist. So to, 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 to describe the main contributions, I think there's three of them. First, we develop a model of two-sided many-to-many matching markets in which agents can make continuous transfers to one another, but that allows for both these types of budget constraints that I discussed, as well as other income effects, so other forms of non-quasilinear utility. And our main result shows that stable outcomes exist in this setting, as long as agents see the interactions that they participate in as net substitutes, kind of in a similar sense to what uh, Alex described yesterday. Uh, and an important point here is that this existence of stable outcomes is gonna apply even in settings, even when competitive equilibria may not exist. Uh, and I think one conceptual point that kind of emerges from our analysis is that uh, it turns out that flexible prices are going to play a key role, both in the existence of stable outcomes, as well as in the other results 
that we are able to obtain about matching markets with budget constraints. And this is unlike most matching models where even if they allow for flexible prices, whether there are flexible prices or not, typically doesn't play such an important role. So to kind of put things in context and to also explain why we obtain uh, such different results from uh, previous work, let me start out. Let me start out by explaining the key condition on preferences that most matching models have imposed. Uh, so this is the gross substitute condition, right? Uh, and I think Alex probably described a bit about it uh, yesterday, but let me remind you what it is. I mean, in the context of a labor market, what gross substitutes requires is that increasing the salary of one worker cannot increase, uh, must weakly increase demand for all other workers. So increasing one worker's salary cannot make the firm make a firm stop hiring another worker. Uh, and the reason that this condition is very useful is that it entails that the deferred accept Galen Shapley's deferred acceptance algorithm is gonna is going to go to a stable outcome. I mean, it has other other important implications. So, for example, that the set of stable outcomes forms a lattice, a uh, structural result structural results about the set of stable outcomes like the rural hospitals theorem. But despite the fact that it's a very elegant condition and a useful one as well, it turns out that it's very restrictive once one has budget constraints or other income effects. So for a simple example, suppose that there's a firm who values two workers, call them W1 and W2, at $5 each, but has only $3 available as a hiring budget. Well, if the salaries of these two workers are $1 and $2, the firm is going to hire them both, right? Because the one and $2 are both less than the $5 of value that are, at which the firm values the workers. And it's affordable for the firm to hire both of them because one plus two is just three, that's the budget. But now if the first worker salary increases by a little bit, say to just a bit above one, then what's going to happen? The firm will no longer be able to afford to hire both workers. And so the firm is then going to only hire a cheaper worker. So that's the first work. So what happens here is that raising the salary of worker one can make the firm stop demanding W, the second work, W2. This is a gross complementarity. Huh? And so, I mean, even in the simple example, the gross substitutes condition fails. I mean, this example had this like sharp discontinuity at a budget constraint, but you can obtain uh, this, the similar issues arise whenever a firm has income effects or any, ty any type of, any deviation from the standard quasi-linearity assumption, as long as the firm doesn't see the workers as inferior goods. And so our approach is gonna to be to assume a net substitutes condition instead of a gross substitutes condition that's going to permit uh, some types of, that's going to, that's, that's going to permit budget constraints. Uh, but the fact that, we, that we're gonna use a different condition is gonna mean that our analysis needs to be different. Right? So instead of using uh, like order theoretic methods, on things like Tarski's fixed point theorem to analyze these models, um, a model, we're going to need to use topological fixed point theorems. And in terms of a conceptual point, that um, this conceptual point about uh, the, 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 the key role that flexible prices play, let me just point out uh, what I think was one of the more surprising points from our analysis, which is that it's, it turns out that under this, in the presence of budget constraints, uh, the flexibility of prices plays a key role in stabilizing the market. So what do I mean by this? Let's just suppose, I uh, assume this, this net substitutes condition that we're going to assume throughout, but, uh, but force but fixed prices. So suppose that there are fixed, make prices completely rich. In that case, it turns out actually the stable outcomes may not exist. And this is unlike the case of gross substitutes, when I mean, you know, the, it, it, where there are models where prices are flexible, rigid, there are models where prices are flexible, but whether prices are rigid or not doesn't affect whether you have a stable outcome. So unlike the case with gross substitutes, when you have budget constraints and net substitutes, in fact, uh, the flexibility of prices plays a key role in stabilizing the market. Um, it's also going to have other roles. So for example, the, the flexibility of prices is going to make sure that agents can focus on simple blocks. You know, when thinking about a stable outcome in principle, to check whether an outcome is stable, agents would need to look at all at, at, at complicated blocking sets that could involve many, many agents. But 
we show that uh, under net substitutes with flexible prices, in fact, agents can focus on just docs between a single pair of agents. And this is despite the fact that there could be complementarities uh, in this market, the net substitutes condition and price flexibility mean that you can just focus on these simple types of blocks. So uh, just a clarification. Um, so for the moment, can I think of uh, rigid price to uh, mean uh, fixed price and, and the flexible price to mean like continuous uh, really divisible money and price or? Yeah, yeah. Think about flexible prices as continuously divisible. Probably if you had a discrete, like if you had a very fine grid of discrete prices, that would probably work. But if there's large, I kind of want to compare two extremes, one in which salaries are totally fixed and the other one in which they're continuously, they move okay. continuously. Okay. okay. Thank you. And so this is, so with, when with rigid prices, it turns out you can't do this. Um, it's, it's not sufficient to look at pairwise blocks uh, to check whether an actor is stable. And again, this is unlike the case of gross substitutes, where it always suffices to look at pairwise blocks, regardless of whether prices are flexible or rigid. And I think a third point, which is perhaps, uh, I think, m much less surprising is that price flexibility is also important uh, for the stable outcomes to be efficient. So when prices are flexible, it's going to turn out that stable outcomes are going to be weakly prioritized or efficient. Uh, so I think yesterday, uh, Michi pointed out that, um, uh, that you know, if you're thinking about like a housing market model with rigid prices, one, could, one can get a constrained uh, prioritized or efficient outcome by running a top trading cycle algorithm. I mean, so it actually turns out when in, a, in more complicated settings and agents can demand multiple goods, stable outcomes can actually be uh, Pareto inefficient. Uh, but with, with not, but that can't happen with flexible price. That relies on rigid price. So in terms of related literature, I think most of the related literature is from, I think Alex described in the first lecture, but let me explain the most related things. I mean, there's been some work on matching markets with continuous transfers and income effects, but it's really focused mostly on settings with unit demand. So some old work by DeMoss and Gale and Gelson Crawford that allows agents to only participate in one interaction to experience income effects. And that, that, that work was kind of extended uh, in, in a joint work with uh, Tamash Kleiner and Zuzianko to settings uh, in which there could be growth substitutes. But this, remember this growth, the, so what we do, the, the difference in this paper is that we're gonna take seriously the possibility of income effects or budget constraints for multi-unit demand agents, wow. where this growth substitutes condition is very strong. I mean, there's also this housing market uh, model, which I think Alex must have discussed extensively in the first lecture, uh, but, that uh, the, there, the difference is that in that in that setting again, you have this unit demand unit supply structure, uh, whereas we're going to allow agents to participate in multiple interactions at once. And there's actually been there's actually a paper uh, by Mongol and Roth, an old paper that shows that there's some counterexamples relating to uh, existence of stable outcomes with budget constraints. Uh, so it's not much in the way of positive results, I think, because the focus there was not exact, not really on the net substitute condition. I mean, we're going to build on, this is, this is really a market with indivisible goods. So we're going to build on previous work on existence of equilibrium with income effects and indivisibility. So for example, the important work of Daniel of Kosovo and Marota, as well as the methods that Alex uh, presented yesterday in lecture three. Uh, and, you know, this is all topological. And we're not the first by any means to use topological fixed point methods in matching. So for example, this has been applied in uh, large markets uh, to show existence of stable matchings and presence of complementarity. The difference is we're focusing on small markets, but we're still going to use topological fixed point methods. Okay, so in, I think that's all I have to say in terms of introduction. The rest of this talk, I want to, there's going Maybe, to be six parts. Uh, yeah? may, may I ask you a question? So sure. uh, could you go back to the previous slide? So the first bullet, uh, that's a transferable UTP case, right? You have, uh, people have uh, quasi-linear preferences, a uh, quasi-linear uh, utility, and uh, there is no lower bound of uh, money consumption. So those two cases shows that uh, first a group of paper look at the case of transferable utility case. I so I think DeMont and Gale and Kelso and Crawford both allow non-quasi-linearity, but only on the unit demand agent. So for example, in Kelso and oh, Crawford, there's firms and workers. The firms are quasi-linear, 
so it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of without this lower bound. But the workers uh, can have uh, non quasi linear utility. So it's not, oh, it's not a uh, tangible utility. Yeah, but, but if we focus on quasi linear case, uh, gross substitution is sufficient condition for the existence of core. Yeah. And uh, maybe what, uh, one way to describe what you are doing, uh, a part of thing what you are doing is to, uh, so to assume quasi linearity, but uh, impose a uh, lower bound on money consumption. And then the existence of core is not so uh, obvious and you get a new condition. And this condition can also accommodate uh, you know, uh, 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 models with income effect. It, it's yeah. So that's going to be an important special case of what we're doing, but we don't, we're going to also allow for non quasi linear, other forms of non quasi linearity rather than just. Flexibility of price means, you know, you, you can continuously transfer utility, but uh, you impose lower bound of money. Yeah, so that's, that's an important special case of our model, but we'll also allow non quasi linearity wow. where it's not transferable. Well, even continuous transferability of utility is very important. But yeah. imposing lower bound could be, you know, uh, yeah. you have a way to deal with lower bound. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I, stop. Um, I, shut, I shut up. <laughs> Go ahead. So in the rest of the talk, there's going to be six parts. First, I'll discuss the model. Then I'll discuss the notions of demand that we use as well as the substitutes condition. I'll explain why competitive equilibrium doesn't exist. I'll then restore existence by looking at stable outcomes talk a bit about how we prove existence of stable outcomes and then discuss the properties of stable outcomes in our setting. So let me start with the model. In the model, we just have a, it's a two-sided market. So we have a finite set of buyers, B, finite set S of sellers. And for each seller S and each buyer B, there's some finite set we denote by omega S B of trades between S and B. So you should think about an element of omega S B as just an interaction, directed interaction from S to B. Okay, so two important examples to keep in mind as to what this trade could represent are first in a labor market, it could represent all the aspects of a job contract except for the salary. And uh, in, in, a, in a, an exchange economy, it could represent what good is being exchanged as well as who is buying and selling. These are kind of the two important examples of trades, but we're going to take trades as the primitives. Uh, um, I, 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 I'm yeah. lost. So what this omega, omega is, is contract between seller and buyer? Yes, but it doesn't specify a price. So you should imagine it says that uh, I work for a Stanford as a, postdoc, as a postdoctoral fellow with an office in Landau and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but not my salary. That's what a trade represents. So if I understand that, uh, my impression is this uh, uh, large omega set it, it contains only two elements, zero or one. And if it's zero, S is not matched with B. And if it's one, S is matched with B. It so, could be, so uh, it obviously could... I'm wrong, right? So, so there's one, one, one case is that there's only one way for me to work at Stanford. But in yeah. principle, there could be other ways for me to work at Stanford. That's contract, right. contract between S and B. Yeah, so right. I, I want to I, I give about, you assistant professor's job. I give you S, B gives you S, you know, postdoc job. That's another omega. So that, that's the way to interpret exactly. omega. So, so, yeah. Okay, so that's a contract between S and B. Yeah, I just, I want, whenever I talk about a contract, I also want to think about it as specifying a price. So a trade is like a contract, but without the price, right? Oh, I see. Okay, good. That's yeah, now I understand. Yeah, okay. So, um, okay, I see. So the, we're going to let omega, capital omega denote the set of all trades and we'll denote by omega j, the set of trades that just involve an agent j. So whenever I have some set and I put a subscript of an agent, that just means I focus on the part of that set that involves the agent. And uh, we're going to allow, put, we're going to define preferences in a way that allows sellers to have constraints on what they can sell and buyers uh, can, can have constraints on how much they can pay, okay? So 
to be a little bit more precise about this, for each agent J, there's going to be a utility function defined over two things, set of traits and amount of money you end up with, and taking values in the real line, but all, not just in the real line, also allowing minus infinity. And the way I want, to inter want you to interpret this level minus infinity is that you get utility minus infinity if you violate the feasibility constraint. So if a seller does something it cannot do, for example, I work two jobs, or if a buyer ends up with too little money, uh, so they've overspent their budget. Uh, now I need to put some, I'm gonna need to put five technical assumptions on these utility functions uh, to make sure that we can interpret the utility functions in the way I just, interpret the constraints as uh, in the way that I want them to be interpreted, just constraints on what sellers can buy and how much buyers can pay. So the first con condition we need to put is that sellers only have constraints on what they can sell. And so the, the way we formulate this condition is that for each seller S, there should be some family we'll denote by SS. It has to contain the empty set. And it's a, it's a family of sets of trades that are feasible for S. So for example, it could say, I can work for at most, this FS could consist of just all singleton sets as well as empty sets. And that would say I can work for at most one job. And the condition that this FS needs to satisfy is that the utility of some set C of trades and an amount M of money must be a real number if C is in this family of feasible sets. And utility must be minus infinity if C is outside the family of feasible sets. So I get utility in the real line. It's everything is feasible if the set of trades is within the family. And I get utility minus infinity if the set of trades is outside the family, regardless of the amount of money I end up with. So here sellers don't have any lower bound on their consumption of money. This is not relevant because sellers are going to get paid, right? We really wanna focus on them constraints on what they can sell. Buyers are exactly the opposite. Buyers are only going to have constraints on how much they can pay. So the assumption here is that for each buyer B, there's a lower bound, which will denote by M lower bar B. It's in the real line or it could be minus infinity. In effect, that would mean there's no lower bound such that utility of a set C of trades in amount M of money is a real number if M is above, if for an amount of money that are strictly above this lower bound, utility is minus infinity for amounts of money that are strictly below the lower bound, okay? And here I'm leaving, I haven't said anything about so far about what can happen exactly at the lower bound. So, you know, yesterday, I think in the, in, in the equilibrium existence duality lecture, there would have been an assumption that basically agents cannot hit their lower bound. So that was this open consumption set assumption. I'm not going to make that assumption here. I'm going to allow both for open and closed consumption. Okay. So these are the real economic assumptions. The rest, the, the, the remaining three assumptions are more standard and are really technical assumptions. So two standard conditions we're going to need are continuity and monotonicity. Let me just say for sake of completeness exactly what we mean by them in this context. So continuity just says that all agents utility functions need to be continuous in money away from level, away from utility level minus infinity. We also need a condition that there's not any jumping of, uh, there's not jumping around too much at the, uh, at exactly at the lower bound. So for the buyers. Uh, in, so what we're going to assume is that for each buyer B and each set C of trades, if I take the limit as the amount of money approaches the lower bound from above, of utility that must equal the buyer's utility exactly at the lower bound. So the point here is you cannot have a jump downward exactly at the lower bound on consumption of money. Uh, and we're going to here just for just, I mean, there's this possibility, you know, that this lower bound is minus infinity. And so for notation, I'll let utility when money is equal to minus infinity, just be minus infinity. Okay, so you can think about this as saying that utility is continuous and it's right away from this possibility exactly at that lower bound and is right continuous at the lower bound. But it's possible that I could exactly having utility the lower bound could be feasible and anything below could be infeasible. Okay, monotonicity is also standard. I think it's just, I'm going to assume away from utility level minus infinity, everyone has strictly increasing utility in money. I'm also gonna assume that buyers utility functions are weakly increasing in trades and sellers utility functions weakly decreasing. So here the point is you should think about trades as, represent, as representing the sale of a good, okay. Uh, typically, actually this assumption is not imposed in the matching literature uh, because it's not needed in most arguments, but we really do need it. 
But on the other hand, I think it's a mild assumption. It's just like I can think about it as a free disposal condition. The last assumption is really innocuous. It constrains something that can't really happen really inside the model, but we make it just because it simplifies the proofs and analysis a bit. So this is an, it's an innocuous assumption to make sure that the Hicksian valuations from last lecture are well behaved in this context. And so the assumption is just for sellers, if as the money, amount of money they have goes to minus infinity, utility must go to minus infinity. The reason I say this is innocuous is sellers are going to get paid. So they can't end up with less money than what they started out with. Uh, buyers and dually for buyers, the condition is that as money goes to infinity, utility must go to infinity. And again, this is not something that can really happen inside the model because buyers are going to be paying something. They can't end up with more money than what they started out with. We just make this assumption so that Hicksian valuations are well based. Okay. That's good, but you're gonna simplify my exposition. Okay, uh, so I think that's all I have to say about, oh no, I have some examples of utility functions. So the most, the, the basic example is of course, quasi-linear utility. Let me look, call that for now quasi-linear utility without a hard, or without a budget constraint. And that's just where utility is given by the sum of evaluation and then a valuation for trade and the amount of money you end up with. And in this case, you know, if, the, if we're talking about a buyer, their lower bound is minus infinity, right? You can go, and this utility is well-defined and away from, and, and, and finite, regardless of what the amount of money is. And basically then buyers can spend arbitrary amounts on, on the indivisible goods within the market. A second example, which is the one that uh, Amici brought up earlier, is quasi-linear utility, what I'll call quasi-linear utility with the hard budget constraint, okay? And in this case, utility is exactly like the other, the, the more basic quasi-linear case if money is greater than zero, but it's minus infinity if money is less than zero. So here, this lower bound is zero, and we allow the possibility that agents can run out of money. They can spend their and all of the money that they have. Okay. And I think this is an important case to keep in mind. The third example is just to review, you know, what happened in lecture three. So we can also allow for the possibility that agents can't run out of money. So for example, if utility is given by the quasi-logarithmic form. So where utility is uh, law, for if money is positive, it's just log of the amount of money minus log of minus this quasi-valuation of the set of traits, uh, if, and, and minus infinity if you have less than or equal to zero uh, money. And so here, again, this lower bound is zero, but it's of a different type. You know, you cannot hit the lower bound. So I think in lecture three, we allowed for the first and third functional forms, but not for the second. In this paper, we're also going to allow for the second, and you can also imagine combinations. Like, you know, like you could imagine some, some, non, some, some non-linear valuation for money, uh, but but where you can run out of money. And that's also allowed by a model. Okay, so I think that's all I have to say about uh, the model. Let, let me now talk about demand. Uh, so a notion of demand is going to be particularly standard. Let me start by just talking about Marshallian demand. So Marshallian demand for a buyer B, uh, let's also, a buyer also need for, to define Marshallian demand would also need to fix an income, right? If I take an income, let's say uh, above uh, its lower bound, sorry, it should be lower bound of B, not lower bound of J. Whenever I talk about an income, I'm going to assume that the buyer has strictly more income than their lower bound on money. It's not interesting if the buyer does not have any money to spend. Uh, and given some price vector, so that specifies prices for all the trades, what Marshallian demand is defined to be is just a family of sets Xi star of trades that are the component of a bundle, C star, M star, of trades and money that maximizes the buyer's utility subject to the constraint that the total value of this bundle cannot be more than the buyer's income, right? So the condition is just, and how do you calculate the value of this bundle? Well, it's just the sum of the amount of money you end up with, because money is priced at one, and the total prices of all the trades in this set, C. And that needs to be at most the buyer's income double. Right? So I guess this inequality is what in most of microeconomics we would call a budget constraint. Uh, then there's also a dual problem, which is Hicksian demand. So I should say, I, maybe I should have said this before. This is all just translating the usual concept of Marshallian and Hicksian demand into the, into the language of matching model, right? where we talk about trades instead of goods. And for a Hicksian demand is defined by saying for a buyer and a utility level, U and a price vector, 
well, now it's, it's a dual problem, right? So instead of maximizing utility subject to budget constraint, you minimize expenditure subject to delivering a minimum minimal level of utility. So again, this is the family of sets C star of trades that are the component of a bundle C star M star of trades and money that minimizes this total value M plus the sum of the prices of the trades subject to delivering utility at least U. Right? And so, so far, I mean, I described this for buyers. You can do it exactly in the same way for sellers, but for sellers, remember that instead of paying the prices of trades that they participate in, they get paid the prices of trades they participate in. I get paid a salary, the firm has to pay me a salary. And so the sum of the signs are flipped. I'm not going to go into the details. It's exactly the same on the ones. Um, and another point is just as in lecture three, you know, the Hixian demand is basically quasi-linear in the sense that at each utility level, Hixian demand has a quasi-linear representation as demand for evaluation called the Hixian valuation. Exactly the same methods go through. Right? So I now want to explain kind of why hard budget constraints cause make things technically challenging. So without hard budget constraints, right, we know Marshallian and Hixian demand are upper hemi continuous, and they kind of and they give the same demand that's in optimum in the sense that uh, if I if I evaluate, if I look at if I fix prices and and um, and the income and I calculate indirect utility, Hixian demand at that indirect utility will equal Marshallian demand at, this, at the price endowment. And vice versa, you know, if I start with a utility level and I look at the income that I would need to get that utility level at a given price factor, Marshallian and Hixian demand again will coincide. So the parameters are different, but the sets are kind of the same. With high budget constraints, Hixian demand it turns out is gonna be well behaved, Marshallian demand is not going to be. So here's a super simple example to illustrate what's going on. Let's suppose there's a buyer who values the trade at $2 but is budget constraint. So this is quasi-linear with this lower bound zero, okay? Let's, if the price of this trade is a dollar, there's gonna be two bundles that cost a dollar and deliver utility at least one. And what are they? Well, I could not trade. So I don't buy anything and I just keep, I end up like I have $1. That delivers me utility one, right? Another thing that delivers me utility actually more than one is uh, if I buy, if I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I participate in the trade, so I buy the good and I end up with no money. That also costs a dollar because the trade costs a dollar and it delivers me utility at least one. But there's a very important point here, which is that, the, uh, which is that these bundles deliver different utility, right? So the utility of not trading but keeping $1 is just one, right? Because I just get that $1, but the utility of participating in the trade and ending up with no money is two dollars, is two, because I value the trade at two dollars, right? So what does this tell me? For this agent, at a price of one, and the utility of and the, and the income of one, the agent will want to buy the will want to buy the trade. So Marshallian demand means is going to consist of just is, is going to be unique, and it just says I I want to participate in the trade. Hixian demand is going to look different at the utility of one because both of these two bundles are expenditure minimizing bundles that deliver utility at least one. And so Hixian demand at a utility of one is not going to be unique. It's going to consist of both not participating in trade and participating in trade. So there's this gap between Marshallian and Hixian demand. Similar things can kind of happen in the usual setting with divisible goods when some prices are zero. But this is happen this happen when with in indivisible goods, this even happens with positive prices. And Marshallian demand is also discontinuous in this example, right? So if I increase the price by a little bit, suddenly this uh, trade will become unaffordable if I only have $1 and the trade costs a little bit more than a dollar. And so then Marshallian demand would jump in, in a way that's not upper hemi continuous to just not, uh, I would to just not demanding the trade, right? Because there's nothing else you can do if the trade is more expensive than the amount of money I have. Sorry, it's kind of like a stupid question, I believe, but the, um, so uh, your point seems that Hixian demand should be well behaved uh, with budget, yeah. constraint, hard budget constraint. Um, when you explain that uh, Hixian demand actually has these two bundles at the optimum, uh, so um, it, it did not particularly sound like a, well, example of well-behavedness. So in what sense is it? Um, so, so what purpose what, does it serve? Well-behaved here means it's going to be a primary continuous. I'm going to be able to use Hixian valuation. 
Uh, and yeah, that, that's really what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Whereas Marshallian demand, when you're dealing with something that's not Abrahamic continuum, it's, it's trickier. Ah, okay. um, right? So, anyways, but we're going to be using the, the main solution concept we're going to be talking about is stability. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, that's not really going to, I mean, there's going to be, it will turn out as a connection to Hicksian demand, but it's not actually start, we're not going to start uh, from, when Hicksian demand is not, a, it's not like a starting point for our analysis. Okay. Ah, okay. I see. I see. I I, I suspect that this uh, having these two bundles at this particular price may help uh, the uh, yep. the Higgs and demand to be to continue to be above him continuous. Is that? Yeah, exactly. That's what it does. Right? Got it. Thank you. So it turns out Higgs and demand is up and continuous. It's actually easy to check too. Uh, like for example, if you move prices, uh, I mean Higgs and demand. It's, look, it's it's demand for Higgs and valuation. We're in the quasi-linear case. It's not like Marshallian demand. Right. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, and this is gonna cause some technical challenges when we're, whenever we look at things from the Marshallian perspective. And so that's gonna come up throughout the paper. Uh, so I guess now let me talk about the substitutes conditions briefly. I think Alex discussed this yesterday, but let me just say what the sub relevant substitutes conditions are in the context of a matching model. So remember growth substitutes is a condition on both income and substitution. It's the condition on Marshallian demand. And so what does gross substitute say? Like a utility function for a buyer is gross substitutable at an income W if for all trades omega, all initial price factors T, if I start from there and I raise the price of omega from P omega to P prime omega, if demand at P is, uh, is, is unique and is given by C and demand at this new price is given by C prime, then for any trade psi that I started, that I started out demanding, and that's different from omega, I've got to keep demanding that trade psi. What economically this is just saying, I raise the price of omega, I hold income fixed, I can't stop demanding any other trade. That's it. This is for buyers, you need to put opposite kind of condition for sales. And net substitutes is exactly the same condition, but instead put on Hicksian demand. So it just changed, instead of fixing an income, you fix a utility level, instead of looking at Marshallian demand, we look at Hicksian demand. So just let me go through it though. So it's a utility function is net substitutable if for all utility levels, all trades omega and all price vectors P. If I raise the price of omega from P, P omega to P prime omega, if demand started out at C and ended up at C prime, then for any trade side that demanded at C and different from omega, it must, be, it must continue to be demanded. So if I consider a compensated increase in the price of omega, it cannot lead and make any other trade stop being demanded. That's what Hicksian demand is. And remember, these two conditions are equivalent when you have quasi-linear utility without a budget constraint, but in general, of course, they're going to be different. Right? And to get at the difference uh, in the context of budget constraints, let me go back to this hey, example. Ravi, I had. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so are you done with the example of non -ex possible non-existence? Non of equilibrium. Yeah. So, so, oh, so I can, you yeah. pointed out uh, upper hemicontinuity may fail with hard budget constraint, but yeah. uh, uh, so we are under the impression that uh, uh, existence is related to sort of convexity of demand. Uh, so if convexity fail, so if I uh, uh, demand this point and this point, not in between, then that creates uh, disequilibrium. So we are not quite sure why fail, failure of upper hemicontinuity leads to non-existence. Okay, let me do this. Let me go forwards a little. I'll cover that and I'll come back okay. to the yeah. substitute yeah. Uh, discussion. So here's the simple example. There's going to be another example which I'm going to describe in a moment. But uh, so the, just imagine this is a there's a match. This is a matching market. Okay, so you have one seller and you have two buyers. Seller is S, and buyers are B and D prime. A seller is only willing to engage in one trade. It has that constraint. I can only sell, I only have one unit of the good to sell and I have a reservation value of zero. Each buyer is going to value the trade at $2 but have an income of only $1. That's again where this discontinuity was coming from. I claim that there's no competitive equilibrium. So ah, what does a competitive equilibrium mean here? I need to price both omega and omega price. But these trades are basically the same. So it's without loss, it turns out that focus on focus on, assume that the price are the same. Oh, I see. So if, okay. if, the price, if, if the price is less than or equal to a dollar, both of the buyers are going to demand the trade. I see. 
And if the price is greater than a dollar, neither will demand the trade. And so what can you do for equilibrium? Either both will demand it or neither will demand it. There's no way for only one to, one to demand the trade. Oh, uh -huh. I see. So this is the failure of existence. This example may seem a really nice edge because it relies on both buyers running out of money at the same time. It turns out it's not actually that nice edge. Here's so a more I, complicated I, I, I guess the point is at the price of one, if buyers are indifferent between buying and not buying, that's the upper hemicontinuity condition. Then exactly. it like exists. Okay, I, I'm with you. So I think, by the way, you might have seen this a little bit from the things Elizabeth was discussing in lecture two. You know, somehow when you're thinking about equilibrium with indivisible goods, indifferences are really important, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that's kind of one way of looking at the, some of the geometric ideas that she was describing. Very good, thank you. So let me actually just now give you the more complicated example, no point in coming back to this later. So, so there's, a, there's, there's, an, there's another example where I'm gonna give you where it's the non-existence is not going to rely on uh, this knife edge case where two endowments are the same. So the, the example here is it's gonna be a little bit more complicated. There's a single seller and a single buyer and there's two trades, okay? So you can imagine I can sell two units of a good to someone. Again, the seller is the same as earlier, only willing to engage in one trade, reservation of value is zero. The buyer is going to have some more complicated preferences that are going to have some interfacts. factors. Okay? So the utility, the, what the buyer's utility is defined in the following way. Given a set C of trades and amount M of money, if the money amount is at least zero and I don't participate in trade, utility is just M. Okay. Then I'm going to value, if, if, if I'm going to value the first of the trades, whichever, which, the trades are going to be the same for me. Uh, and if I'm going to value the first of trades at the min of the amount of money I end up with, then what? So there's this non, the value of the, of, the, of the trade is going to depend on the amount of money I end up with. This is a non-quadlinearity. And uh, if, there's, if the second trade, I'm going to value it one. So if I, if I get both trades, my utility is going to be given by the amount of money I end up with, plus one, plus this min M one. And there is a, there's this hard budget constraint type behavior. So if money is, if I end up with less than zero money, I get utility minus infinity. Uh, I claim that there's no competitive equilibria if the endowment, if the income of the buyer is less than one. So let, I'm not gonna go through the details of the calculation, but let me explain to you kind of what happened. So again, because these trades are the same, it's without loss to assume they have the same price. The buyer is going to demand both trades if the price of the trade is at most half the buyer's income. And where does half the buyer's income come up? It comes up uh, because uh, you know, if, the, if the price is above half the buyer's income, I can't possibly demand both. So it's only possible for me to demand both if the price is at most half my income. On the other hand, if the price is anything above half my income, I'll demand neither of the goods. And that comes from the non cost linearity here. And so again, you have the same issue where the seller has one, wants to sell one or the other, the buyer is either going to want both or neither, and you have a, you have a non-existence of competitive equilibrium. And here, this is for a range of endowment or a range of, range of income. So it's not some, this is not a knife edge. Uh, it does not rely on knife edge income. Yeah, there's a little bit, in fact, initially when Alex and I were working on this, we thought, no, it can't possibly be, uh, it must be that if you move if you move incomes around, you will get uh, you'll get existence. And we tried for some time to prove it, and then discovered in fact the statement was not true. So, so this is this is why we're going to have to deal with a different solution concept. Huh? So, any questions about this? Or? Let me go back then, finish discussing the substitutes, and then we'll go to the existence itself. Okay. So substitutes. The issue here is. Uh, you know, well, you know, when growth substitute is really restrictive with budget constraints. I kind of already explained it in the introduction, right? If you have a buyer who has quadrilinear utility with this hard budget constraint, values two trades at five dollars each, and the buyer has an income of three dollars, then the utility function is not growth substitute. Okay. Basically, because raising the price of one trade can make the other trade on a form. Uh, but it turns out this is net substitute. Okay. I don't claim it's obvious. Uh, I don't think it's actually that obvious, uh, but I don't want to go into the details of the proof. Now, let me just say that the way you prove this result is when you need to just calculate the Hicksian valuations 
at all utility levels and just check that they are substitute that they, they, that they are substitute valuations. Right? So really, one can check net substitutability by using some standard cost linear type logic applied to Hicksian valuation. And so, given that gross substitutes is really restrictive, we show uh, we're going to show we show we, we instead work with net substitutes. And in fact, gross substitutes implies net substitutes. So there's a, we have a statement that applies even with high budget constraints. Uh, so the statement is that if uh, utility function of an agent is gross substitutable at all income, and we also need another technical condition, which is that if the agent is a buyer, utility is strictly increasing in trades, not just in money away from utility level minus infinity. So this is like a strict version of free disposal. I value the goods I buy, then the utility function is net substitutable, okay? I mean, we showed this without budget constraints in lecture three. The reason I call this a result is it actually turns out that one needs to put quite a bit of effort in to prove this result in the presence of budget constraints. That comes because we can't just easily go from between Marshallian and Hicksian demand because they can look different. Okay, so I guess now uh, I've finished. Uh, yeah? Ravi, uh, can you go back to the uh, example where you showed that uh, it was not a knife edge case. Yeah, so, sure. In fact, so uh, so here it was important that uh, there are multiple possible trades between S and V, right? So if if um, uh, for each pair of S and V there is a unique trade, that means it's either matched or unmatched. Then uh, is it a knife edge or can you still come up with some example? So I don't I don't know of an example just because I haven't worked it out. I suspect it's not going to be any different. The reason I suspect this is you could imagine that instead of there being one seller, there are two sellers, and uh, they could sell. They can either sell. They can each either sell to this buyer or to another buyer, and the other buyer is always going to buy up one of the trades then that's going to leave um, this buyer again with the same question of which seller does it buy from? So typically I think in these, these types of examples don't rely on uh, there being one, don't defer on whether there's one trade or multiple trades. If you're the, the key, the, the important thing here though is that there's a buyer, it might be important here that there's a buyer who can buy two possible things uh, and, and actually can buy, it's not just a unit demand buyer, that may be important. Uh, but this is, I'll have to think about coming up with an explicit example in, the, in which each pair of seller and buyer has a unique trade between them. Okay, thank you. Okay. So um, thanks for that comment. So I guess the next point is, you know, we have non-existence of competitive equilibrium. I've set up the conditions that we need on preferences. What are we gonna do? We need to change to a different concept. So since competitive equilibrium may not exist, we're instead going to consider stable outcomes. And kind of the logic behind stable outcomes is a bit different than the logic behind competitive equilibrium. So here now, I think the contracts that, uh, that Michi was mentioning at the beginning are going to come up. Uh, so the idea here is we're going to think about represent market outcomes in terms of contracts between pairs of agents. Uh, so a contract, the definition is just that it consists of a pair of a trade omega and a price T omega, where this price is a real number. So for example, if omega is a job contract without a salary, omega P omega is just a job contract. Okay. And I mean, okay, I allowed that this, that this P omega is a real number. We assume monotonicity. So it's no different if you restrict to positive or non-negative prices here. Uh, I just allow negative prices because typically in matching models, one will allow that. Uh, and what an outcome consists of is just a set of contracts that has at most one price for each trade. Okay, so it doesn't specify, you know, I work in Stanford as a postdoc at one salary and I work at Stanford as a postdoc for another salary as well. That's like, doesn't make sense. So an example to keep in mind of what an outcome is, is in a labor market, an outcome needs to specify two things. It needs to specify a matching of workers to firms. So that's like a set of trades and then a salary for each, for each worker that's hired. So that's what a market, out, that's what an outcome would represent here. Um, and we're going to need to consider our agents' choices from sets of contracts. That's just kind of a different way of looking at demand. And so given a set Y of contracts that involve an agent J and uh, income W for the agent, we'll define agents' 
choice correspondence in the following way. So you maximize over all outcomes Z that lie within the set Y of contracts of the utility that the agent obtains from that outcome. So what's the, the way, how do you define utility from that outcome? It's just the utility that the agent gets from executing the trades in Z and the amount of money it the agent would end up with if I start with W and I make either I pay or I get paid all the amounts that are specified by the set Z of contracts. So if I'm a buyer, I have to pay the prices of all the trades and all the contracts in Z. If I'm a seller, I get paid the prices of all the contracts in Z. And so that's the way when... Yeah, mm -hmm. this looks like Masharian demand. What, what's the it relationship is exactly. between C and Masharian demand? No difference. The difference is only in the parameter. Why? You can think about a set of contracts as basically equivalent to a price vector. It's just yeah. that some price, if I'm a buyer, some prices could be infinity. In principle, this outcome could have multiple prices for a single trade, but mm -hmm. it doesn't. That's, okay. that's not really yeah. relevant. So this is essentially a Masharian contract. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, so now uh, the definition of stable outcomes is the following. I mean, it's a, this is a kind of standard concept from the matching literature. So uh, given an outcome, uh, given an, if I'm going to have to fix an income profile, right? Because the market out when you have income effects, market outcomes totally depend on how much uh, agents have to spend. Right? An outcome is individually rational. So an outcome is just a set of contracts, right? A, and it's individually rational if for each agent J. I look at the set AJ of contracts in A that involve J. And the condition is that when the agent has access to that set AJ of contracts and has uh, income WJ, the agent must choose one of the utility maximizing choices must be this entire set AJ. So the agent could not strictly benefit by unilaterally dropping some of the contracts. The second, this is, this is kind of rules out individual deviations. We also need a condition to rule out group deviations. And so we say that, uh, uh, say that an outcome is blocked by some non-empty set Z of contracts. If, when I, if for all choices that the agent, an agent could make, starting out when, it, when the agent has access to both the contracts AJ that, it, that are specified by the outcome and the contracts ZJ that are specified by the block, for all choices that the agent makes out of that, you must, the agent must choose all of the blocking contracts. So the idea here is that all the blocking contracts, if the agent had given, given access to all the existing contracts and all the blocking contracts, all the agents will choose all the blocking contracts, potentially in addition to some existing contracts. And an outcome is stable if it's individually rational and it's unblocked. Let me unpack this a little Rab by Rabbi, comparing I, 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 I'm sort of lost. So usually a group of people uh, is going to block uh, original contract I, large A, right? And uh, who, who is blocking in the second bullet? I only see J. I what see. What so is the blocking set of agents, coalition in this notation? It's, it's the set of agents that are participants in Z. Oh, so for see, example, then, then Z could say, okay, good, yeah. good, yeah. So okay. I think to get a little bit in that direction, you know, this concept may not be that familiar. Let me compare it to the core, okay? Uh, so it differs from the core in three ways. First, uh, it, it, we impose individual rationality. Right? Usually when thinking about the core, you don't allow the possibility that an agent can drop some part of the interaction, but not the whole thing. If an agent is going to unilaterally deviate, they have to just walk out. Uh, uh, the second is that agents in the blocking coalition can retain some existing contracts with the outside. Uh -huh. right? So when you're evaluating these choices, agents choose not just, they don't just look at the blocking contracts, but they also look at the existing contracts. And the third part is that agents in the blocking coalition must want to choose all of the blocking contracts, not just that they get an improve, utility improvement by doing that, but actually that this, this is kind of like saying the block must be individually rational in a way. So I think the, the reason for thinking about a concept like stability is in a setting where you don't think about like all these interactions as happening together, but each contract kind of happens in a way separately from one another. So I can choose to just drop one, one contract, but not another. And once one has that in a setting where these contracts are kind of independent in that way, I think stability becomes a, a reasonable cooperative solution concept. But it's, there's kind of a, so that's the, 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 I think that's the key difference with the core. Whereas in the core, you kind of imagine everyone is getting together, and I I can't you know I can't separate pieces of the interaction. I cannot separate 
uh, my participation in the in, in, in a coalition in the multiple pieces. So you might say, well, why, what's going on with these stable outcomes? Why is it going to help restore existence? Let me go back to these two basic examples with non-existence and explain how we get existence here. So let's go back to this example where there's a single seller, two buyers. The buyers have $1, but want, are willing to pay $2. Or value the trade at $2, but only have a dollar. In this case, there's a stable outcome where one buyer buys for a dollar. This is kind of the only natural outcome in this market, right? You might say, well, why is it stable? Well, what about the other buyer who wants to buy for a dollar? Well, the other buyer, the one who doesn't buy, is unhappy, but he, can, he cannot make the seller a better offer, right? I mean, I, the buyer only has a dollar. The seller is already getting paid a dollar, so there's no way for me, me to make an offer that the seller strictly wants to choose. I can only make the seller indifferent. And if I make the seller indifferent, that's not a block, because then one thing that the seller would choose out of the original contract of the block would just be the original contract. So, the, 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 but the logic here is basically that the buyer, the other, the buyer who's getting kind of rationed out, cannot has no way of making the seller strictly benefit from a deviation. Uh, similar thing goes on in the other example. Um, but let me just, let me not go into the details here, but basically what happens is you get a stable outcome where one, one of these trades is executed. So that's kind of what has to happen. And the price is exactly this half of the income, which was the critical price at which there was a discontinuity in uh, demand. That was kind of the only possible thing that one could see as an equilibrium. And that's what, the st that's what stability picks out. Right. Yeah? In those two example, examples, mm -hmm. Is the core equal to the set of stable outcomes? Um, is there any difference? If there is a difference, it, 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 you know, I, I can really use use those two simple examples to appreciate the difference between core and the stable. So, so it's it, going to be the same in the first example. Uh huh. I'm not sure about the second okay. example. Okay. Okay. I, I will see. So I, yeah. Yeah, okay. I will explain to you in a little. I mean, the core is going to come up later. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about it. Is it true that the core is a superset of the set of stable? Yes, it's true, but it's a non-trivial theorem in this context, and it relies on flexible prices, actually. Okay, yeah. Um, but in general, in the even, even with flexible prices, it's known that, that there can be core outcomes that are not stable, basically, because core outcomes may not even be individually rational in general. Uh, so I guess now this brings me to the main theorem of the paper, which is that under net substitutes, stable outcomes are going to exist for all income profiles. Now, this generalizes kind of previous existence results from matching with transfer that assume like quasi-linearity or gross substitutability. There's some old work uh, in the, by Vince Crawford with Knorr and Kelso. And also there's more recent work that work deals with models of matching in networks. And our result generalizes the two-sided case of those results. Uh, I see there's a question in chat. I don't know if that's a question. Okay. Oh, it's an, uh, okay. Um, so, but unlike in those results, uh, the flexibility of prices is going to play a key role in our setting. Uh, so the reason is to explain this. Let me. Let me. I, I need to take. I need to. I need to take you through a result uh, from the from the matching with contract literature. So, with when there's without flexible prices, it turns out that its trades with different counterparties must be gross substitutes for stable outcomes to exist, where this must is in a maximal domain sense. Okay. So this was shown by uh, Fuito Fuito and John Hatfield in the case of many to one magic. So you might say, well, what's going on? How are we suddenly incorporating gross, uh, gross complementarity? Right? Because net substitutability, we, there, can be, there can be these gross complementarities between between trades. And so in fact, net substitutes permits gross complementarities between all pairs of trades. And so in fact, it turns out to be strictly weaker than, uh, than, uh, than the, the condition that John and Fuito identified to be a maximal domain in the case without flexible prices. So how is it that we're doing something that's weaker than a maximal domain condition? It's because we added a different, we added an assumption, right? The assumption that we added is that there's these flexible prices. And that totally changes when 
when uh, when uh, when when stable outcomes can exist. So what John and Suito showed is that if you don't have flexible prices, if one person has gross complementarities of, of this type, so for trades between different counterparties, it could be a problem. But it turns out that could be a problem relies on the absence of flexible prices. So once we have flexible prices, we can start to incorporate these gross complementarities. Okay. So I think this, Alex probably explained some of the subtleties about thinking through these maximal domain results. Uh, because sometimes, you know, if you add an extra assumption or you go a bit outside a model, maximal domain results actually don't really apply. Uh, and that's what's going on here. So uh, you might, I want to kind of zoom in a little bit and give you an example to explain exactly why flexibility in prices changes stability. Okay. So the example is going to be a many to one matching market where there's two uh, buyers and two, two sellers and two buyers. Okay. This is a labor market. The sellers, S1 and S2 are workers. They can work only one job. The buyers are firms. Okay. The buyer is going to have a quasi-logarithmic utility function uh, with an additive quasi-valuation. So let me just show you a picture of what the demand looks like. It's exactly something that Alex covered from in lecture three yesterday. So it's going to be, I, I don't know if you guys remember this diagram. This was a diagram from the failure of ascending auction. So I'm going to assume that the buyer B's demand looks exactly like this, okay? And there was a gross complementarity here. And so at the, in this bottom region is where the buyer is gonna demand both goods. At high prices, the buyers will, buyer will demand neither. And in this top left region, the buyer is only gonna demand, say, the first trade. But as you increase the price of the first trade from here to here, you can cross, go from demanding both to demanding only the first trade. And so there's this gross complementarity. And that's what's gonna come up here. So. That's the buyer, the, 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 that's buyer B. The other agents are all quasi linear. Okay? So buyer B prime has unit demand and would prefer to hire S2, say, by a dollar. S1 would like to work at, but S1 is the one who would like to work at B prime. S2 would like to work at B. And all these preferences about who they work with is just by a dollar, okay? So what goes on here? Let's say salaries were fixed at $4. It doesn't really matter that this number is $4. Okay? Then what would then we are once we fix salaries we're like in a standard matching model without contracts nothing it's just agents have preferences over counterparties right what are the sellers prefer the sellers preferences are really simple right so S one I mean has I, I assume prefers to work at B prime salaries that the two firms are paying are the same so the seller is still going to prefer to work at B prime S two is going to prefer to work at B right. And what's gonna happen for the buyers? Well, buyer B is the interesting one. There's gonna be the gross complementarity. So at buyer B, it turns out, if you do all the numbers, is that B would like to, would like to uh, hire both workers. And failing that, would like to hire only S1, but is not willing to hire S2 on its own. So that's, there's this gross, gross complementarity here, right? So having access to S1 at a salary of $4 makes S2 desirable. Uh -huh. It turns out that this can happen under net substitutes. Uh, I, I, I'm not gonna explain exactly why, but it's exactly the same types of gross complementarities that can happen that I think Alex discussed yesterday. B prime is just gonna wanna work at, uh, is gonna wanna hire S2 and prefer, uh, and feeling that would like to hire S1. So it turns out there's no stable outcome in this matching market without contract. I, I, the, I learned this from Samson Alva's PhD thesis. Uh, he has this example. Uh, so let me explain to you why there's no stable atom here. So what, where could there be, how could you have a, what, what are some blocks that can happen? Well, S1 wants to work at B prime, right? So that means if B prime doesn't hire anyone, there's gonna be a block, right? Where S1 is just gonna go and work at B prime. So that means B prime has to hire someone. Now, B prime is going to hire someone. That means B can't hire both. But then B doesn't want to hire S2. So that means B has got to hire S1. So let me just annotate. So we've kind of figured out that if there is a stable outcome, what has to happen is that B is going to hire S1, right? And that means that B prime has to hire S2. But now there is a block, right? What's the block between these two? If 
case, S2 says, no, I don't want this job, just leaves B prime and says, oh, I want to work at B, B is going to hire this S2 because B would actually like to hire both work. And so there's no stable match. So what is going on here? I told you that a stable matching has to exist with flexible prices. How is it that price flexibility is going to solve this issue? The way is this. Let's suppose that, uh, let me clear this and go back to not annotating. So if, S, if S1 salary at B could rise a bit, it turns out it just needs to rise to four and a half, say, then that's going to change B's preferences, right? Because B has an income effect. And how is it going to change B's preferences? Well, now S1 is more expensive. So if B hires S1, there's like B is poorer. And this S2 is a normal good. So that means that what can happen is that S2 can become less desirable. So in fact, when you raise the salary of B of S1 and B, B is now going to want to hire, is, is now going to prefer just hiring S1 over hiring the pair of S1 and S2. And this restores existence of stable outcomes, right? There's now a stable outcome in which S1 and B are matched and S2 and B prime are matched. So what happens here is basically the salary rise, the salary, the when S1 salary rises, that kind of undoes the non-existence that was coming from the gross complementarity. Okay. So this is the key, this is the key mechanism at play in what in, in this paper, ultimately, that flexible prices are able it, to undo. Yeah. So so in this case, is is it also uh equilibrium? Yeah, yeah. In this case, it's a competitive equilibrium as well. I mean, this in this case, there wasn't actually a hard budget constraint. Okay. So in this case, this the stability and competitive equilibrium actually coincide. Uh, but I think you know when you think in, in order to do a comparison with the case with uh, fixed prices, you really need to look at stability. It's hard to think about competitive equilibrium in that context. Right. Okay. So let me continue. I want to give you now an example showing that about thinking about how to get. I think now it's kind of getting a little bit at the proof of this. So in lecture three, I mean, you should have, we, uh, Alex showed you an example where uh, there was a multi-unit ascending auction that didn't get the competitive equilibrium when the buyer said income effect under net substitutes. So that was the failure of the ascending auction under net substitutes. Here, I'm gonna give you an example that shows that deferred acceptance can fail in a labor market when firms experience income effect and have net substitutes preferences. You just kind of think about, just think about it like a descending salary adjustment process. So it's like worker proposing Deferred, it's like a worker proposing matching algorithm where salaries start at the worker's favorite levels, which is very high and then fall. The example is going to be a little bit more complicated than Alex's example. So I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to give you the details. I'm just going to kind of give you a picture that explains it. So what, in what's the structure of the example is the following. There are six workers. Mm -hmm. There's three of one type. I'll denote them by S1, S2, S3. Three of another type, which I'll put hats on. S1 hat, S2 hat, S3 hat. And there are two identical firms, okay? The, the buyers, B and B prime, and they each want to hire up to two workers of each type. So what that means by want to hire up to two workers of each type is they get zero value from hiring any more than those, just those two workers, okay? And uh, the buyers are gonna have the, are gonna have quasi-logarithmic utility, and the seller is just simple quasi-linear utility with unit supply. So how is this going to look? Let me just show you a picture of seller's demand. So the way I'm going to plot it is actually, I should say one thing. So because there's identical workers, there's three identical workers of one type and there's three identical workers of another type, you don't need to keep track of six different prices. Just two prices is enough, right? The hat workers are all going to get one salary and the non-hat workers will get another salary. All the salary that the non-hat workers, S1, S2, S3 get, I'm going to call P. And the salary that the hat workers, S1, S hat, S1 hat, S2 hat, S3 hat get, I'm going to call P hat. And I'm just going to show you what buyer's demand or the firm's demand for workers looks like as a function of P and P hat. And what demand means is just a number. How many workers I want of S1 of the non-hat type, how many workers I want of the hat type. The way demand looks is like this. So let me explain the picture. At very high prices, firms want nothing. At, very, at low enough but positive prices, the firms will want two of each worker, or two workers of each type. But as 
And then, you know, kind of as, as the, roughly speaking, as the price of the first worker, as the prices of the non-hat worker, so as P falls, the firm will want more and more of the workers S1, S2, S3. As P hat falls, the firm will want more and more of the hat workers, S1 hat, S2 hat, S3 hat. But the picture is a little bit, the, the structure of this picture is a little bit strange. So I think you might have seen in lecture two, Elizabeth would have drawn uh, some, some pictures of this site that decompose the space of prices into, uh, in this, based on which, what demand is. And there are these indifference points where demand changes, this indifferent, this locus of indifference prices. This, so I mean, ultimately what I'm drawing for you here is that type of locus, but it doesn't have the same uh, geometric structure as in the case of quasi-linearity, right? So you can kind of see this picture looks distorted in a way, right? Uh, and that's because of the income effect. So to just give you an example of where there's a gross complementarity here, let's look around here. So if the price, if I start, uh, let, me, let me annotate a little. So if I start here, I'm gonna be demanding one of the first, one of the non-hat workers, zero of the hat workers, right? I drop the salary of the hat, of, of P. So that's of the, I drop the salary of the non-hat workers and I'm gonna suddenly start demanding a hat worker. Right. So I guess to put it differently, if I start here and I go up in salary, I, I raise the salary of S1, S2, S3, and I stop demanding one of us hat one, S hat two, S hat three. That's again, it's this gross complementarity issue, right? But anyway, this is just like a two unit, this is like exactly the types of examples Alex covered, except with kind of two units of each good. And where is the equilibrium or stable atom that are kind of the same in this context? It's at the red dot. Why is it at the red dot? Well, you know, we have a total of three workers of each type. So a total of six workers, right? And that means that kind of each firm needs to demand three workers. And uh, what happens at this point is that the firms are indifferent between having two workers of one type and one worker of the other type or flipping two, one and one, two. And so at this price, at these prices, I can allocate two workers of one type to one firm one where I, I can basically split the workers to one. So if to, let's say S1 and S2, S1, S2, S3 hat go to one firm, S1 hat, S2 hat, S3 go to the other firm and both firms, that's going to be within both firm demand sets. Uh, I guess um, thinking about it is, you can imagine there's kind of three units of each of the two goods for say, if I think about S1, S2, S3 as one good and S1 hat, S2 hat, S3 hat as another good. So the market supply is three, three. And at this point, the firms are indifferent between bundles two, one and one, two. So I give one firm two, one, I give the other firm one, two, those add up to three, three. And so I'm in equilibrium. But let's think about what happens if I look at a dynamic uh, matching process to get here. So let me, let me think about deferred acceptance. I'm gonna suppose that S1, S2 and S3 start by making offers. So their sal everyone's salaries start very high and S1 and S2, S3 start making salaries at lower and lower prices in order to get employed. So what will happen? Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, here we go. I start at a very high salary. It's going to fall, 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 fall. Initially, right, if salaries are too high, no one is going to get hired. Eventually, the firms will want to hire one of, S2, of S1, S2, S3, but not more. And after a while, the firms will become indifferent between hiring one and two workers of, of, of S1, S2, S3. And at that point, everyone is gonna be employed because there's two firms. So up to four worker, up to four could get hired and there's only three of them. But at this point, the salary is gonna have fallen too much. I just look down, we're going to be the salary, the salary P will have fallen all the way here, which is too low. It's below this red dot. And so there's no way for the deferred acceptance algorithm to get it to raise the salary. That would rely somehow on the workers retracting offers, which is not something the deferred acceptance allows. And so deferred acceptance cannot, poss cannot possibly end up at the stable matching. Kind of what's going on here is that, the, is, that S, is that S1 hat, S2 hat, and S3 hat need to make offers. And because of the gross complementarity, if S1 hat, S2 hat, and S3 hat start making offers, to work at lower and lower salaries, 
then the firm will be willing to hire S1, S2, S3 at higher salary. But so if S1, S2, S3 start out by making offers, their salaries will have gone down too much. So deferred acceptance fails here. Similarly, this also applies to other versions of dynamic, of dynamic matching procedures, like the cumulative offer process and uh, uh, Kelsey and Crawford descending salary adjustment process. So it can give slightly different answers in when you have gross complementarities, but in this case, they're all going to fail. This would be the same if we did it the other way, except then you end up too low instead of too far left. It's exactly the same because the gross complementarity is, goes in both directions. So I guess at this point, you know, I've said what doesn't work about the proof of existence. Let me now say a little bit about how we actually do prove existence. Um, we'd like to go, you know, stable matching is a little bit hard to get our hands on in the setting with continuous prices. And so one would like to go via some equilibrium concept, but there is no way to go via an equilibrium concept here because there's no way to go via competitive equilibrium rather because competitive equilibria don't exist. And so the idea is we're going to use a workaround for, that's from the general equilibrium literature, which is instead of supposing that agents maximize utility, we're going to suppose they minimize expenditure of obtaining their equilibrium utility. So it's kind of like we look at mash Higgs in the man instead of mash Ali in the man. But actually the way that what this is called in GE is the concept of quasi-equilibrium. I don't know if you guys know it, but I'll define it in this context. Uh, so given some income profile, uh, WJ, a quasi-equilibrium is gonna consist of two things. It consists of a set of traits that I think about as like a worker firm matching, as well as prices for all the traits, including the ones that are not realized. So this, this price vector has to specify the price, the salary that I would get if I wanted to work in a law firm in New York. I mean, I think my salary would probably be zero there, but anyways. Um, the, 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 and the condition that we need to impose is that letting UJ be the amount, the utility that J gets from the set CJ. So that's the set of trades in the set the, the, the set of trades, the set of realized trades that involve the agent, the utility that the agent would get from that set of trades at this given price vector and the income. So I calculate the amount of money you end up with by adding or subtracting prices as appropriate. Two conditions need to be satisfied. First, the UJ needs to be greater than minus infinity. So the agent cannot have ended up in some invisible state. And second is that the set CJ of realized trades must be in the agent's 16 demand at this price, like price and utility level. So this is like just a way of formulating competitive equilibrium, except instead of, in, it might be easier for me to remind you of what this is in the standard general equilibrium things. Standard GE would say, you know, uh, compet in competitive equilibrium, it, it must be that given, at, the, at the market price, of, there's no uh, strictly preferable bundle that's weakly cheaper than the one that I have. Quasi equilibrium says there's no weekly preferable bundle that's strictly cheaper. This turns out to be a weaker concept, basically because Hicksian demand, you, you can allow uh, this, these, there can be some bundles that are expended for minimizing, but not utility maximizing. And so the reason that this is technically useful for us is that these things correspond to competitive equilibria in some, in an appropriate Hicksian economy, right? Because in Hicksian economies, agent's demand is given by Hicksian demand. And so technically this is this, when we look at quasi equilibrium, that's gonna let us use some of the methods from lecture three. Uh, and- a Question. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's a paper by Milgram and Bruno Storovich talking about pseudo equilibrium or something. At yeah. uh, some price vector, you, you have aggregate demand. And if yeah. you look at the convex hull of aggregate demand, supply lies in the convex hull. So that's, uh, Generalization of Walrasian equilibrium. Is there any relationship between Milgram, Bruno's uh, equilibrium and no. quasi equilibrium? So it's There's not. those two things are unrelated. Yeah, quasi, so pseudo equilibrium, I think we've, one, one easy way to see this is, you know, pseudo equilibrium is something that's meaningful even in our transferable utility setting. Whereas in transferable utility setting, quasi equilibrium and competitive equilibrium coincide. Mm. So pseudo equilibrium is, I think, an orthogonal uh, uh, weakening okay. of competitive equilibrium. Okay, good. Thank you. So the, and the, the reason that this quasi-equilibrium is useful is that we're going to be able to map from quasi-equilibria to outcomes in a useful way, which is I just take, if I take a quasi-equilibrium, I forget, I can obtain an outcome by just forgetting the prices of all 
the unrealized dream. So I just forget the salary that I would be paid in a law firm in New York and remember only my salary that I get paid by Stanford and that defines an outcome, right? And so for every quasi equilibrium, we can get an outcome. And the reason this is useful is let me go back to this, the simple example that in, of non-existence, whether the seller, one good, reservation value of zero, and there's two buyers who have only a dollar to spend but value the good at more than that. So what's the quasi-equilibrium here? There is a quasi-equilibrium in which the price is a dollar. And what's, what's the quasi, what are the quasi-equilibria supported at that price? One buyer is gonna get to purchase the good and the other buyer is not. And so the buyer who gets to purchase the good gets a utility of two, right? Because I value the good as two dollars. The other who doesn't get to purchase the good values gets a utility of only one dollar, right? Because I just keep the dollar that I had. And the reason this gives a quasi-equilibrium, I mean, the thing that one has to check is like, well, how, how is it that this, unhappy agent is somehow expenditure minimizing. But it turns out they are. Why? Because if I look at Hicksian demand uh, at a price of $1 and a utility of $1 for this agent, that's going to include not only participating in trade, but also not participating in trade. Uh, why is that? Well, both not participating in trade and keeping a dollar and participating in trade are going to cost me $1. And so although I'm not indifferent between the two bundles, their costs are the same. Uh, and the thing to note here is, you know, this, this outcome is exactly what was picked out by stability. So the, 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 the quasi-equilibrium outcomes corresponding to these quasi-equilibria are exactly the stable outcomes. And that's what lets us uh, actually formulate a proof. The way we do this proof is we can divide the proof into two steps. First, and then that's, we showed that under net substitute, quasi-equilibria exist for all income profiles. And second, we show that every quasi-equilibrium outcome is stable. And that gives us existence of stable outcomes, right? Let me just say a little bit about these two points, these two propositions. The second one is like some version of the first welfare theorem. It needs to be, it's not quite the first welfare theorem because it deals with quasi-equilibrium, not competitive equilibrium, and it deals with stability, not trade or efficiency at the core. But it basically turns out one can use a version of the proof of the first welfare theorem to show this. And unlike most results in the matching literature, this turns out this proposition actually relies on the monotonicity of utility in traits. So if, the, if what was being transacted was bad, you can't apply this proposition. That's the reason we really made the assumption of this free disposal condition at the beginning. The first proposition is in, in, in a way the deeper one. I'm not gonna go into the proof right now, but the way it works is we combine some arguments for matching uh, with some topological fixed point argument from the proof of uh, equilibrium existence duality. So we can't really just apply the equilibrium existence duality directly because the technical conditions we needed to apply that machinery are not satisfied in this model. But there are some, there are some uh, ideas from the matching literature about how to kind of get some additional regularity conditions on preferences, which is what we need to be able to apply the topological fixed point argument from the proof of the equilibrium existence duality. Uh, I should say we really need to use the proof of the result, the result is because the result itself uh, deals with competitive equilibrium and relies on uh, the absence of a high budget constraint. So I think that's, let me, I was gonna think about saying more about the proof, let me skip that. But I would like to say a little bit about the properties of stable actin. I promised Michi I would talk about the core. Mm, so let's, we'll call an outcome is in, an outcome is in the weak core, right? Uh, that's the concept we're going to deal with. If there's no blocking coalition that can strictly improve the utilities of all the members in the blocking coalition by re by form by recontracting only among themselves, so you lose all the when I form a, when this, this blocking coalition has to drop all the contracts with outside and they need to recontract among themselves in a way that strictly improves everyone's utility. And the reason this is an efficiency condition as we, it, it entails something about efficiency is if you look at the grand coalition. Uh, what this, if I take an out, the fact that if, if, a, if a grand coalition cannot deviate, that means that the outcome has to be weakly Pareto efficient. And so weak core outcomes are weakly Pareto efficient in the sense that if I take a weak core outcome, there's no outcome that everyone would strictly perform. Uh, and the theorem here is that under net substitutes, every stable outcome is in the weak core. Okay. And this relies critically on, flex, on the flexibility of price. There's examples in an old paper of Blair showing that stable outcomes may not be even weakly Pareto efficient uh, with rigid price offs. 
but um, but uh, so in, in our context, we're able to we're able to show existence. We're able to show this efficiency by exploiting flexible price, the flexibility of price. I don't. I'm running a little low on time, so let me not say anything about the proof of this. But I'll just say this: all the proofs in the paper go via quasi equilibrium. The key technical tool that lets us relate one concept to another concept is always quasi equilibrium. So the way you kind of the way we kind of show this is we go from stability, stability to quasi equilibrium to the core. So let me skip this. Um, let me also say one other uh, uh, something about pairwise stability. So this is this idea that you know in, in general when you're thinking about stable outcomes, it, it, checking stability requires agents to look at potentially like blocks that involve many many agents. So in order to think about simple blocks, I call an outcome pairwise stable if it's individually rational and there's no block that consists of just a single contract. Right? So this is like this is the concept that you would obtain if you kind of look at in, in, require agents to focus on these very simple blocks. Uh, and under growth substitutability, it's clear that this coincides with pairwise. It's been shown in the literature, but the reason is very simple. If there's some set of contracts that blocks an outcome. Then, well, if these contracts are substitutes, if agents want all of them, they're going to want any one of them on their own. And that, so therefore, any one of those blocking contracts will be a block. And the net substitutes, though, this argument totally doesn't work because there can be gross complementarity. I may want one contract only if I get another one too. Nevertheless, we show that under net substitutability, stability and pairwise stability coincide. And so even in the context within income effects, uh, simple blocks are going to suffice. And this is despite the presence of gross complementarities among large sets of contracts. I should say, I don't think this is an obvious result. It also turns out to rely critically on flexible prices. So if prices were rigid, this would not work. Uh, and the reason is, so, I mean, with rigid prices, with, with fixed prices, in fact, we give an example to show pairwise stable outcomes can be unstable. I don't think this is altogether surprising because there's these gross complementarities, right? And so if two contracts are complement, if all contracts are complements, for example, how can I possibly just focus on deviations of one contract at a time? But there's an intuition here that comes from flexible prices, which is I can move, I can sometimes move prices to undo the income effects. That's like what went on. The, the, and that possibility turns out can mitigate gross complementarity. And so what happens is if I take an income profile and individually rational outcome, if I have some set of contracts that blocks the outcome, let's say the set consists of omega one, p omega one up to omega k, p omega k, then it turns out that there's going to be some L between one and k and some new price, p prime omega L, such that if I look at the trade omega L at this different price, p prime omega L, that's gonna be a block. So instead of just saying, okay, I take this set of contracts and I pick out any one and it's a block, what will happen is I, there will exist one of these contracts. Let's say if I take that contract, I move its price and I, get a, I will get a block at some, at some point. So the proof I should say, again, goes via quasi equilibrium. So the, but the economic point here is the following. Although simple blocks suffice, with budget constraints and income effects, it's not obvious how to simplify a block that can rely on moving price offerings around to kind of get, uh, avoid the gross complementarity. So I think I'm running out of time. I just have one more slide I want to discuss, which is I focused a lot on positive results that we could obtain. We, the, there, the, there are lots of other results in matching theory, right, which are important in many ways for matching market design. And those, many of those, it turns out, don't go through under, growth, under net substitute. So despite the fact that stable outcomes exist, we have examples in the paper that show uh, that, for example, the set of stable outcomes may not form a lattice. You know, so they are not generally going to be buyer optimal or seller optimal stable outcomes. And why is this? Well, basically, if there's a budget constraint, let's say Fujito and I work at the same employer, that budget constraint means that there's kind of a constraint on the total amount that Fujito and I can get paid. And so our interests are not going to be aligned. And because of that, there's not generally going to be a seller optimal stable outcome, even in many to one matching markets. 
uh, when you have these, when you have uh, net substitutes. So I mean, this, the intuition emphasized budget constraints, similar logic works with income effects as well. So was that the case in this uh, simple example you have with two buyers? Is that, is that, uh, what? So you have this uh, very simple example with one seller and two buyers. Uh, is that, is that, uh, is that an example of this? Okay. One seller and two buyers. I think it is, um, yeah, I guess there's two stable assets in that example, right? One in which one buyer buys, other in which the other buyer buys. Yeah. So that's, uh, that is, that's a, uh, thanks for that. We have, we had a much more complicated example in the, in the paper. Well, the, the example in the paper turns out also to show some other things which don't hold in this example. But yes, yeah, so that's a very simple example to see, see this point. Um, also the lone wolf theorem or rural hospital theorems can fail. So I don't, let, let me not assume you know what these things are. I'll just tell you what exactly we show, which is it can turn out that an agent can be matched in one stable outcome and in fact receive above their autarky utility but be unmatched in others. Um, and actually, now that Fuito has pointed out this, the simple example with one seller and two buyers, same, that in fact already happens here, right? Because if, I'm, if I buy in one stable outcome, I'm, ha I'm very happy in that stable outcome, I get above my autarky payoff, and in the other one, I'm not matched either. But I guess the thing is in the paper we show even, within, even when there's income effects but not high budget constraints, the same issues can arise. The last example is, a, the last thing is more complicated, okay? So it turns out there can be no, there's no stable matching mechanism that's strategy proof for all unit supply sellers. So like, you know, if you're thinking about a labor market work with under growth substitutes and I mean, and one needs another condition in general, but uh, the, 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 um, the uh, there's no, the deferred acceptance algorithm is not, uh, one, uh, yeah, the, 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 the deferred acceptance algorithm May not uh, may not it, it, it is going to be stable and strategy proof, right? For all the workers, the worker proposing deferred acceptance algorithm. Here, there's no such point, right? Uh, basically, because the intuition is this: for any stable matching mechanism, it doesn't. This doesn't rely on net substitutes or budget constraints or anything. I can misreport to lower someone else's salary. So, for example, I can misreport to lower Fujito's salary. And if in the end, Fujito and I end up working in the, in the same firm, that can make it so that there's more budget of that firm available to pay me. And so this feedback through the budget constraint can make it so that misreporting can improve my own utility. And the result is this can happen for any, it, it, in, 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 in some cases, this can happen for all stable matching mechanisms. So there's no stable and strategy proof mechanism. So I think the point here is just when one goes beyond issues of existence, it's, uh, things become more, more complicated than the net substitute. So I think this is all I have to say. I, I ran a little bit over, but uh, let, um, I apologize for that. But I, let me just conclude now. So the starting point for analysis is that, you know, when you think about markets with indivisible goods, prices may not, and budget constraints, prices may not stay the market. Nevertheless, we show that stable outcomes are still going to exist and be efficient in the sense of this weak parade or efficiency, even in the presence of budget constraints, as long as this net substitute is satisfied. And so the point here is that stable outcomes can exist despite the presence of gross complementarity. And it's even, and even and in this setting, it's even enough, despite the, despite the gross complementarities, agents are still able to focus on these simple pairwise blocks in order to identify stable outcomes. So some things work nicely, but gross complementarities make the structure of the set of stable outcomes break down. And there was this conceptual point, right, that flexible prices plays a critical role in our results, unlike in previous matching models, where whether prices are flexible or not didn't really affect anything but efficiency. They didn't affect, like, differ they didn't affect uh, existence or many of the properties of stable matching. So I'm going to really focus so far on matching and existence and these things, but I think our results have some implications for thinking about auctions with budget constraints. So, you know, because deferred acceptance and ascending auctions may not work, the, the, gen, the more general point is that gross complementarities can cause some trouble for dynamic auctions. But what our results suggest is that some sealed bid auctions that implement stable outcomes might still work well. So if I take, uh, if, I take if, I, if I elicit people's preferences, I calculate a stable outcome and use that 
a direct from a auction, it's, in, it's possible that might work well. So this would be a version of, uh, of, of Paul Temperer product mix auction or uh, kind of a Paul Milgram has a different formulation of a similar idea in terms of what, uh, calling it an assignment exchange. But one could imagine that those types of sealed bid designs so instead of thinking about finding competitive equilibrium, adapting them to find stable outcomes might still work well in settings, even in settings with budget constraints. Ravi, uh, and yeah, a clarifying question: What do you mean by may work well? So those sealed I think me, has a nice Bayesian Nash equilibrium, or, or no? The, the, even in even in the so may work well means at least they're going to run and do do be do be efficient. Under, so there's, an issue, there's a critical assumption in these auctions, which is that agents don't manipulate them too much. Uh, and oh, if, I see. right, and if mm -hmm. agents manipulate too much, of course, um, of course, one can end up with highly inefficient outcomes. But depending on the depending on the circumstance, so for example, I know Paul has uh, Paul has implemented versions of the product mix auction for the Bank of England. In certain contexts. Uh, the strategic manip the possibility of strategic manipulation by the buyers may not be that important. So it, it, it will depend on the context. But I should say the dynamic auctions also don't are also uh, like an ascending auction is also manipulable in when uh, when an agent can buy multiple books. So uh, thank you all for listening.